Okay. Good morning and thank you all for joining us today. Welcome back to another amazing session at Microsoft Reactor Bengaluru. My name is Rashmata and I'm the event planner for Bengaluru Reactor. Unlike other reactor session that we usually conduct, today we will have a full day session on various topics and hands-on demos. I would now like to welcome our speakers for today's session. Mamta is an enterprise architect author with 17 plus years of IT experience. She will be covering monolithic to pragmatic microservices with Java. Arvind is a backend developer and has eight years of development experience. He will be covering building and tracing a Java application and Azure container instances. Sandeep is a passionate DevOps engineer with over 16 plus years of experience, and he will be conducting a mini workshop on managing Java microservices and Kubernetes with Build Piper. But before we start our session, quick word on a code of conduct. The key thing to take out here is to be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat will be open throughout and we do encourage you to participate. Also, please keep your mics muted during the session. I will be sharing the event code and the survey link during the session. Please take a look in the chat, sec chat section and do send your feedback to us. It will help us curate topics that better suits our audiences. But for now, I will hand over to Mamta to begin the session. Over to you, Mamta. I think you are on mute. Uh, uh, thanks, Rashmita. Rashmita, I'm not getting that presenter uh, screen option. So can you make me attendee and a presenter again, if you don't mind? Can you just flip me over to attendee and back to presenter? Sure, I'll do that. Just give me one minute. I know that there's some issue with Teams. Hi, Mika. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, Mamta, you are presenter now. Just see if you can share your screen. I'm not getting that option for screen share at all. The uh, option is enabled, but when you click on it, it doesn't give the screens which you want to share. So just give me one second. I'll quit and I'll join back. I'm sorry. Folks, just give us two minutes. Yes. Rashmita, I'm back. Can you just? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Can you share now, Manta? Yeah. I think okay. you can see my screen. Yes. Yes, we can. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking out time on a weekend and joining us uh, for some wonderful sessions which we would be presenting. And uh, Microsoft is organizing such beautiful events in which we are getting opportunities to share our knowledge with a bigger community. So today my topic is more related to how we break a monolithic application to microservices. It's on uh, not about the implementation, rather the things we need to keep in mind when we think about breaking a monolithic application to microservices. So two things can be done. Either you develop a microservice from scratch or you already have a monolithic application and you want to deploy uh, or convert that application to microservices. So in that journey, the journey is pretty difficult when we start breaking a monolithic to microservices when we translate that, the transition journey is pretty difficult. So I'll be just comparing monolithic and microservices and giving you a fair amount of idea. How does the architecture look like? And what's the difference between the both the architectures? 
So I've picked up a food to go type of application whose architecture uh, pictorial representation of the architecture in monolithic and microservices we can analyze and I've kept that running in AKS cluster and I'll show you how uh, what else services gets deployed when we are deploying that into a Kubernetes cluster. So starting with the definition of monolithic, with the word itself, if you go with the dictionary definition of monolithic, you would find that monolithic is something which is pretty, something which is large, which is not that acceptance, having that acceptance of making changes. It is unchanged type of thing. It doesn't allow you to make changes. And when we go across the application's life cycle, we have the designing phase, the development phase, the test, the packaging, when we deploy it, once after deploying, we monitor the application and we go ahead and maintain that application, right? So in every phase of the application life cycle, we may get through a lot of issues or there could be uh, introduction of Delta features and all that. So when we are talking about monolithic applications, because they are very bulky in nature, the acceptance of changes in a different phases of the life cycle is pretty difficult for monolithic apps. Let's try and understand how does the architecture of a monolithic app looks like. So I have a front end UI. I have a data access layer. I have a business logic and I have a database backend. If I have to deploy this application, I would be deploying them as a single executable, either in a physical server or it could be a virtual machine as well, right? But it would be a single executable. When we say monolithic, it is all about a single executable which gets deployed. So people started with monolithic, after a few years, people moved into multi-tier monolithic, and now it's the era in which people are transitioning from multi-tier monolithic to microservices. So if you look at this, if I have to deploy this application in several servers, could be a physical or a virtual machine, I have to deploy the entire set. And DBs would be multiple, then there is a lot of headache to have copying the data, and all that stuff, right? So everything is bundled as a single thing. But if we talk about multi-tier, people moved on from monolithic to multi-tier monolithic. They understood that detaching the database from the actual application would help us. And physical server to virtual machine transitioning was happening at the same time in the IT industry. People were deploying their applications in physical server and after a few days people understood or a few years people understood that physical servers are becoming pretty costly because I can deploy only a single application on that physical server. My application, for example, is listening on some port number 8080. If I deploy another application in the same server, it would not be isolated the application process would be running on the same virtual machine or a physical server, but not in an isolated environment. When things are not isolated, you can't control them from intervening with each other or troubling each other, right? So they thought that they would deploy these two individual units, databases separated, the front end and the middle tier is separated. And because physical servers were not the solution people were transitioning to virtual machines and we can isolate different applications in a virtual environment using vms people started to deploy a multi-tier application into vms and there was a communication set up between the front end middle tier and the back end so that whenever we are accessing the data using the data access layer we can go ahead and connect to our databases so this was the first phase of jump. If we look at the front end part of it, this exact the front end, the business logic and the layer which helps us to communicate with the back end, everything together forms a single executable. This executable is something which is very bulkier in nature and that's the reason it is called as monolithic. So an application which will have a single deployable unit normally Java application, .NET application, C application, C++ application. We have huge bulky block of the applications, right? And we can associate our database at the back end with a client side 
interface for it. And these applications are good in a way that they are self-contained, they are independent. If I want to deploy the front end, the business logic and all, they don't need anything extra entities to work or function. Everything is self-contained in it. So all dependencies, libraries, everything would be cooked inside that VM. And I will not need any other dependencies to be uh, present for the execution of the application. I'm taking a sample food to go application, which we would be uh, discussing in the demo as well. So this food to go application, if you look at food to go applications, this yellow hexagon, which when you see that shows the boundary of a application. So food to go applications, internal boundary of the logic of the code is within this and let me just pick up the pen and if you see here you would have different logics implemented here i have a restaurant management logic everyone uses swiggy type of application right so restaurant guys will feed in the restaurant data restaurant management uh, logic would be managing the restaurants delivery management is the guys those who come and deliver the food to us Order management, when we are placing the order of the food, the order management logic will take, um, like take handle that piece of code. The payment is there, notification is there, billing is there, and everything is like co-located inside the same hexagonal box. This is nothing but the boundary of your application. And every logic would be like compiled and built together and we will produce a single jar or a var file out of this. It would not be multiple executable which will get produced, but it would be a single executable of all the logics which would be uh, created at the end. Now, when we want to interact with other services, like I have a messaging service of Telio, I have a SMS or email service notification from AWS or Azure, I can have payment services of Stripe. If I want to integrate my application with them, I bring in adapters in between. These adapters help me to communicate with third party services. And there are some REST APIs which are implemented if the restaurant guy, the consumer, the courier guy wants to place the order or look into uh, which food to order this courier guy has to serve, all those people would be accessing these REST APIs and would be interacting with our food to go application. One more important point to see here is we have a single SQL adapter and a single MySQL database. So all the logics residing here are looking up to a single DB and the DB also would become pretty bulky in nature. So now the size of the application with time would increase. Today I have a say kitchen management service I want to introduce into that. I didn't have a kitchen management service. I want to introduce a new logic. And I would say that the kitchen guys can show the status. We get a status, right? The kitchen uh, service says that the food is getting prepared. So order management will create the order and hand over the order ID to you. Restaurant guy would pick up and give the order ID to the kitchen service or the kitchen management service and the kitchen management service will show us the status whether the food is getting cooked, food is ready and all that. So if I want to implement a new logic that would becomes a, a very difficult task for us because when the applications are larger in size, the impact analysis of the impact becomes difficult. So size of application also would slow down the development process because I have to analyze n different aspects before implementing a logic, what all places it would create an impact. And larger the application, longer would be the startup time. I already had n number of logics residing here. Now I'm saying I'll create one more, which would be the kitchen management service. I'm introducing a new box over here, which is kitchen management service. So as many number of logics I'm cooking in, the startup time is going to increase. And there would be many obstacles with continuous deployment. So if we go back and try and understand the 
transitioning which is happening in the IT industry. People started with waterfall model. People moved on to agile. Now it is agile plus DevOps. And we started with say monolithic application, multi-tier monolithic, and now microservices. Agile talks about smaller deployment, smaller minimal viable product creation. DevOps talks about continuous deployment. If my application is very bulkier in size, I take hours to build that. I take hours to test that. Continuous deployment doesn't make sense there, right? It, it, it's pretty huge cycle. The time consumption of doing those builds and all that is pretty huge. And we have to write extensive test cases because the overlapping between the codes of different, different logics would be impacting our uh, entire application. When we want to scale, the scaling is also very difficult because it could be a possibility that restaurant management may need a lot of resources and kitchen management may not need that much of resources or order management needs maximum number of resources. In such scenarios, dedicating some amount of resources for each of the threads which are running in an application is not possible. So when we scale, different modules may have conflicts in their resource requirements. When we talk about monolithic, we can't adopt new frameworks, new languages. It's very difficult for us to adapt or adopt to new frameworks and languages. Like these days, you would find that the web interfaces of uh, the most famous uh, e-commerce websites and are using React.js. Today, I want to implement my food to go application using React.js, the front and the loop. I may not be able to do that because the entire framework has to be written or should use a single language. In such cases, adopting newer technologies, newer frameworks, newer logics are impossible when we are with monolithic. And if we look at the pipeline, even though my teams are segregated, I have a team which works on just order management code. I have a team which works on the restaurant management code. I have a team which works on the delivery management code. Yeah, but everyone's code gets pushed to the same single source code repository. So think that this is like a Git or a Azure repos type of thing in which everyone is pushing their code and a single pipeline gets triggered and we execute. We can do n number of stuffs, right? Sonar cube analysis, manual testing, functional testing, integrating with n number of other tools. And finally, when we deploy, it is deploying a single executable, which is large, which is complex, and which is difficult to maintain. Because when you have, as soon as I deploy my 10 test cases have failed, I realize that the code is not good. I got to go back and fix the piece of code, build for 1.5 hours again, and then deploy it. It's not that quicker to fix, test, and deploy and test type of thing. So food to, uh, this food to go application which we are taking, it has become complex with time because there are a lot of logics implemented inside the same hexagonal box. So if you think about the solution, what could be the solution to this monolithic? We need to have a loosely coupled architecture. What sort of loosely coupled architecture? I can have a restaurant management sit separately, a delivery management sit separately, or order management sit separately, and they are just not a function call away. They will have their own REST APIs. Restaurant management will call delivery management's REST API, or order management will call rest, restaurant management's REST API. And they all talk with help of APIs. How till now the courier or the consumer guys were calling the REST APIs and talking to the actual application. Within the application also, the applications would be broken down into many applications and they would not have that much of overlap with each other in the logic terms. That's the reason the word loosely coupled. I can, when we say it is loosely coupled, I should be able to individual independently develop that block, test the block and deploy the block. If I just have the code of my, say, order management, I should be able to develop, test, deploy and see how my order management works. And we would have small teams managing this. It would be worked by small, small teams. And when we think about the application, application also should be highly scalable. 
imagine that a lot of people these days uh, when IPL matches and all go on, right? When six and fours are hit, people go and browse for restaurants. So restaurants browsing, maybe multiple. I need multiple instances of restaurant management here. But when people really create order, there are less number of orders created. So the number of instances of individual mini applications may vary dependent on the demand which we have. I may have more traffic coming to restaurant management. I may have less traffic coming to delivery management or I may have less traffic coming to notifications. So depending on how much of load is being uh, ramped up on each of the individual microservices, I would be scaling them on demand. And when we are deploying these applications, they become independently upgradable. Like when I have a delta change in kitchen management, I'll just go and deploy kitchen management again. I'm not going and redeploying the entire application. I took an example that if I make a change, my test cases, 10 test cases have failed, and I need to go back, analyze, fix it, and redo the entire stuff. So now the test cases have failed just for kitchen management. I'll just look into kitchen management code. I'll fix kitchen management code. I'll build kitchen management in minutes and I'll deploy kitchen management in minutes. That's the intention behind it. So when we think about monolithic, monolithic is pretty powerful type of application. It has everything in it, but that keeping everything consolidated at a single place becomes a pain point for us. So what we want to do, we want to break this into several small, small uh, pieces, but every piece should have its own responsibility. It's not that the pieces are just scattered around here and there. Every piece has its own responsibility and it knows what needs to be done and it would carry that responsibility along with it. That's the intention of microservices. So let's understand what exactly is a microservice. Our application would be broken down into multiple mini applications. And when these mini applications are created, the time to take tension starts that time. Because when all of them were sitting together, they were in trouble many a times. If one is not functioning, the entire stuff used to go down. But when we think about microservices, they are divided and spread across into different instances of the servers. But when we want to make them work together, that is the more challenging part. So we would discuss about those challenges as well. First, let's look up uh, into the microservices definition. So the way we architect our application is microservices. The way we package our application is containers. The way we deploy our application is containers. And the way we orchestrate our application is the Kubernetes way. So a lot of people get confused with these words. They ask you work on microservices or you work on containers. Microservice is a way of architecting your application. And those applications, because they are smaller in size, they are mini in size, we package them as containers. So I will split the application into a set of smaller but interconnected services. Important keyword here is interconnected. They got to collaborate with each other and work together because order management may not be able to furnish the entire flow. It can create an order, but a request has to go to the restaurant that the order is created. It, a flow has to go and hit in the kitchen service code and therein the kitchen guy should start cooking. The delivery guy should come and pick up the order. All those things have to be stitched up together, but they would be in different, different applications. They would not be a single executable or a single application. So when we think of the services, they should have some distinctive features. So a microservice is nothing but a mini application. It will have its own hexagonal architecture and it will have a business logic and it will have a set of adapters with which it can talk to other microservices. 
let's break that food to go monolithic application into microservices and see how does that look like. So this is the microservice architecture of the same food to go application. Order service is having its own hexagon. The restaurant service is having its own hexagon. The kitchen service is having its own hexagon. The delivery service, accounting service, notification service. If you see, every guy is having its own hexagon. The logics are separated. And one more important point. Last time I had emphasized on the SQL database, which was single instance running for all the entire logic. Now, if you see, Every service is having its own dedicated database. And we would have an API gateway which would help us to reach the individual services. And important point here would be interaction between services. How will my services interact to each other? Because if an order service is giving a call to the restaurant service and it doesn't respond, what the order service needs to do? So if you think these days of one more word which is very popular in the market is cloud native architecting. So when we talk about microservices, when we talk about cloud native architecting, we, uh, someone's mic is unmuted. If you can please go ahead and mute your mic, that would be helpful. Thank you. So cloud native architecting or microservices based architecting talks about. Not only about the sunny day scenarios when things will work, we are prepared for all the failures. It's all about failure design. These days when we are deploying our application in cloud, we look for high availability. We look for disaster recovery, right? Same way when we are designing our architecture for our application, we should be in a state to understand if something is not working, what would be the next set of actions? This is one very popular example I normally take. Imagine that I'm going and shopping on Amazon.com, which uh, we do very frequently these days during Corona days because everyone is confined inside the house and we don't have options <laughs> to go out. So in Amazon.com, I'm looking for a blue shirt. Uh, say a blue Van Hoosens shirt. And I find that shirt. I look into the options. I like one shirt. I go and click on that shirt. I see the product description. I see the uh, say vendor details. When I scroll down, I don't find any customer review. So what do I think? That customer review has not been written by any of the uh, customers. So when customer reviews are not being written, it's not that the entire application stopped working if something went wrong. If you think about the architectural diagram of, sorry, just give me one second. So I have a uh, vendor details. I have the product details. I have customer review and I have, say, the front end REST API using which I've logged in, and I'm looking at the product description. I can see the vendor details, but I can't see the customer review. When this request went in, this guy didn't respond at all. That's the reason in that page, the customer review is not populated, but it didn't show me page four, not for error. It shows me everything else apart from that customer review. So fall back in this case so that the people don't realize that customer review is not responding. What they do, if customer review request five times, five retries have happened and it didn't work out, a request will go and it will query for other Van Heusen shirts or other blue shirts. Or you would have seen people, uh, they show up whoever looked into this shirt also looked into some other shirts and all right so they populate the page with those information so that you don't realize that the customer review doesn't exist you don't buy in today and you buy the product tomorrow when i go and look at the same product i add it to the cart and tomorrow when i go and think of buying this product i go and check customer reviews there are say 35 of them 
Overnight, 35 people reviewing the product, not possible. Previous day, this guy didn't respond. This logic didn't respond. So fallback action for the applications have to be ready. Whenever you're making a call to any other microservice, we have to keep in mind, if I don't get a response back, what should I do? How many times I should retry and all that? Those things comes with microservices based architecture. Mm -hmm. When we are architecting our application, that time we have to keep in mind about these stuffs. Now, when we have a microservices based architecture, everyone will have their own code base. Everyone will have their own dedicated pipelines and everyone would have their own deployments to be done separately. And these deployments would be small. It would be simple. It would be quicker to do the entire process of it. So microservices are mini logics which are implemented and those logics will interact with each other. So if we think about microservices, always when we talk about any application, we think about scalability, we think about high availability and all, right? So I'll just take you through a scale cube, which uh, microservices architecture was actually inspired by two guys, Martin and Michael. They wrote a very excellent book called this Art of Scalability. And that scaling had three axes, X axis, Y axis, and the Z axis. I'll just show those axes in dedicated slides. So X axis is simple. Like when I have an application, it could be a monolithic or a microservices based application. It can be a microservice as well. So think this is my order management. If I'm getting quite a few number of orders, I would like to deploy multiple instances of order management. We know about this that we can fix in a load balancer in front of it and I can load balance the workload. So when the client request is coming, it would come via the load balancer. This would route the request to one of the instances dependent on how we have configured the load balancing. With this, what we are doing, we are improving the capacity and availability of our application. So if I was able to serve 1000 requests with one instance, now I can serve 3000 requests with three instances at same point in time. And all these are identical application instances. That is important. So this is called as X axis scaling, which we have been doing from the days of virtual machines as well, right? So that is not much difference. But when we are scaling a monolithic or a microservices based application, I may have want to dedicate a subset of data to a set of instances. Like in this example, we have taken users. Think that in food to go application, I have say one lakh users or say 10,000. Let's take 10,000 users. I'm dividing 3,000 3,000 and 3,000 users, and I have one more instances which has 1,000 users here. So I have a router here who has an intelligence of routing the request to the backend instances. Let it be a VM, let it be a container. If the request comes for an order creation, if the user is from one to 3,000, request will land here. If it is from 3001 to say 6000, the request would land on the second instance. Like that, I would segregate the workload with different instances. This type of scaling also people adapt. This is called as Z axis scaling. Here also you will have multiple instances of your order management, but they would do different tasks. This order management will serve only customers who you customer ID is between one to 3000. So there are different ways of scaling and all. This is one of the ways of scaling. After X axis and Z axis scaling, Y axis scaling talks about breaking monolithic into microservices. I had order service, customer service, review service residing as a single application. I will take this out. I will have multiple instances of order service and a load balancer fit front of it. Suppose customer service calls it, it will call it this way. 
So y-axis would work by splitting a monolithic into a set of services. X and Z axis scaling improves capacity and availability. This improves the in reducing the complexity of the application. We are breaking down into multiple individual services. So these are the three different types of scaling which microservices patterns talk about. Now, if we think about an order service, when we say it is independently deployable software component, it has a REST API, which others can call the clients would be able to invoke those APIs. So order management service is, sorry, this is the client for it. Say it is consumer management service. Consumer is invoking a create order and the order gets created or order ID is generated and it would be published and the consumer management service will come to know that this order is created. If the consumer management service queries the order like find order by order ID, again the request goes here, order ID is found and the response would be sent to the consumer management. So same way here, if you look at it, you can have multiple APIs implemented with the help of which other mini microservice applications can call your microservice and they would be able to interact with your microservice. That's the intention between that. And when we are packaging, we would package in a way that the applications would be very smaller in size. And when we talk about monolithic to microservices, identification of microservices are very important. How do I identify where to break, how to break, what to break and all, right? So when we have the put to go application, the whole bulky application, you can segregate them with individual functionalities they play. And when we are identifying these services, we can break them into individual services like this and implement the REST APIs so that they can talk to each other. So from this to this, the transition when it happens, slowly we would be breaking individual services into microservices. So we, would, we should actually identify the operations. It has to go on the code level, okay? It's not that one fine day you get up and you think that today I'll break my monolithic into microservices, it will not work that way. There are two types of system operations which are important. One is the command system operations, like when I have a create request, a update request, a delete request. Like this logic is getting the create order, it is getting accept order and all that. So there are different types of operations, one which is impacting the application, changing, updating, creating, deleting. And that is going to up, update my database at the uh, back end. Others can be query type of application where you just go and query what sort of information, which are the order IDs, whether this customer is existing, whether these restaurants are existing with our databases, are they residing within the five kilometers of the peripheral of the user who is actually trying to book the food, right? So system operations are very important. You will have to break that into code level and you will have to imagine or say visualize what all requests would be coming from the other applications to me. Other microservices, what they can call. Then only the REST APIs implementations would be done. So these system operations would correspond to the REST APIs or the RPCs or message endpoints would be created and we can implement them. So if we try to think about uh, consumer is executing a create order that would create an order, restaurant guy is accepting an order, this would indicate that a order is accepted. Same way restaurant guys uh, note that order is pick up for the ready uh, order is ready for the pickup. That intimation has to go to the courier guy. Courier guy is updating the current location. I'm present here. Then in that radius or in that diameter, the courier service would be getting up the food pickup requests, right? 
So whether the food is picked up, whether the food is delivered, those all functions, the commands have to be thought of. So every single system operations has to be defined and broken down like this. We have taken an example of a create order. We have to go to the level of what would be the inputs. These are the input parameters. And this is the output which we would send. So I would get consumer ID. I would get the payment method, the delivery address, the delivery time, the restaurant ID and what items the user is actually booking. Looking at all these things. I create an order and I give you the order ID. So some preconditions would be there. Some post conditions would be there. So every single bit and pieces needs to be. Identified or scrutinized so that we don't have any pitfalls in our design architecture. Now, when we are talking about monolithic to microservices, there can be a lot of obstacles which comes in the process of decomposing. When microservices were sitting together as a single executable, order management logic, when it was communicating with consumer management, it was just a function call away. Now order management is sitting separate. Your consumer management is sitting separate. Your kitchen management is sitting separate. They may not be on a single virtual machine either. They can be on different VMs across the network. So imagine these are the three VMs which are in a network. When order management or consumer management gives a call to the order management, it is no more a function call. The network latency will come into picture at that point in time. And when I'm sending a request, am I waiting for the response? So do I need a synchronous communication? Do I need an asynchronous communication? How do I make the, make the data to be consistent across different services? Order ID here should be the order ID here. The consumer's order ID status is delivered. Then the order management should also write it as delivered. The kitchen management anyways, it would be in a finished or the completed state, right? So that data consistency across different services also becomes an important aspect. And many a times we would not be able to decompose a lot of classes. Those classes are used by a lot of other classes or the pieces of code underneath it. So they are like called like a God class. You would not be able to break them into smaller parts. So we would be determining the APIs which other services would be calling and then we would be understanding what would be the parameters they would be sending it to us. What would be the logic we would be uh, executing in turn to our microservice and then what would be the response back like order ID over here order service create order. We would verify the consumer details. We will verify the order details. We will create a kit ticket with the help of the kitchen service. We would say uh, account service to authorize the car. Everything would happen during the order creation. It is just not handled by the order service. It is going and interacting with consumer service, a restaurant service, a kitchen service and a accounting service. So what happens in this case? The flow is going across different microservices and coming and finishing the entire piece of action. So when we are talking about different processes, consumer service is a different microservice, order service is a different microservice. These processes need to talk to each other and when they talk to each other, we need to keep in mind that sometimes the communication can be one to one. Sometimes the communication can be one to many. Sometimes the communication can be synchronous. Like if I ask. My accounting service to authorize the card and card failed authorization failed. I shouldn't be creating an order, right? So order would get created if the card is validated. So in that case, it would be a synchronous communication between both the microservices. I from an order management service, I would in. And I'll wait for the response back.
we may not be blocking. Sometimes we may be blocking. So when we are not blocking, it is like a synchronous message when we are. Uh, can someone confirm if my screen is still shared? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So synchronous and asynchronous communication becomes important. Sometimes we may wait. Sometimes we may not wait. You just create a ticket for the kitchen. You don't wait for anything. Later, when the kitchen service has actually created the ticket, you get a response back with the kitchen kitchen ticket ID and you add that your in your uh, database. But you don't wait for the kitchen ticket ID to be immediately created, right? So in those cases, it is uh, about asynchronous communication. We would be handling failures because there would be a lot of times network timeouts. There could be like when I took the example of Amazon.com, that customer review is not responding. How many times will you retry? There should be some limit on the number of requests you would be sending from the client to the service and then saying, oh, this guy is not responding, right? So we would implement something called a circuit breaker pattern. Suppose five retries are there, requests are going, and the service is not responding, break here. Don't send any further request and take the fallback action. So all these things are like interrelated. If the circuit breaker comes into picture, fallback would get triggered and there would be some limited number of retries which we would implement when the circuit breaker would get triggered. So these are some ter terminologies in the microservices world using which they have different patterns using which we design our applications. When we talk about different different services, I have an order management service. Okay. I have a kitchen management service. I have a restaurant management service. When order management talks to kitchen management or restaurant management, now imagine my whole food to go application when it was residing here, how we used to communicate with an IP address and a port number, right? Now individual services will have their IPs and a port number. Each time order management needs to find out where this contain, con kitchen management or the restaurant management is sitting. One of the biggest drawbacks, let's where's my sketch back. So we have broken down our monolithic into microservices and these microservices would be packaged as con say container one, container two and container three. Containers drawback, they don't have static IP, they have dynamic IP. So if container one wants to communicate with container three, it can send the packet to container three if it knows its IP address and the port number on which it is listening. If this is dynamic, it's very difficult to identify where it is actually running. So this is to discover where this service is running. That is called a service discovery, the next pain point. So when we have a lot of services running, service A, service B, service C types of thing. We need to identify where a service is running to send the request to that service. In those cases, service discovery becomes one of the important points. Service discovery can be done in n number of ways. Client would discover or the server side, we can do a service discovery. In this, we are discovering on the server side. The load balancer is receiving the request and from there, a service registry is being queried this registry is maintaining the entire set of services. It will have A, B and C and its present IP addresses where you can reach A, where you can reach B, where you can reach C. That information would be re retained in the service registry. So you query the service registry, find out where A is running, you send your packet to A. So identifying each time because this IP addresses are dynamic in nature. If a container goes down, it can't retain its network stack. The container is cleaned up and when you restart the container, a new network stack is created. When a new network stack is created, new IP address gets allocated. In such scenarios, 
service discovery plays a very important role. So service registry is the key part of service discovery, a database which would have the network location of your service instances. It will make are highly available and up to date. These guys have to be very uh, dynamic in nature. Whenever a container goes down, loses the IP address, entry has to be removed. Whenever a container comes back, entry has to be created. That is pretty important. So service registry needs high availability and it needs to be very frequently dynamically up updated. Netflix was one of the initial guys in the industries those who started with microservices adaptation. They contributed Eureka, which is a service registry software, uh, to the open source community. In Kubernetes, we use etcd for maintaining where what containers are running. We maintain that information in etcd. Uh, then we have console, we have any n number of other service registry softwares as well, which helps us in maintaining where what is running so that when we are sending packets, we can discover where exactly the service is running and we can transmit the packet. So these were a few of the important points we need to take care when we are moving from a monolithic to a microservices based architecture. Deployment strategies are important, like when we are deploying our application, how can I deploy my application? I can deploy my application on a virtual machine, one one instances. Like here, if you see instance one, instance one X service, Y service, Z service. So these guys, resource utilization would be good, but these services are not isolated from each other. So what would happen? They would interfere with each other. So we would not go with this type of pattern. Multi-service instances per host pattern will not be taken up. It can be a VM, it can be physical servers, but I would not deploy a order management, a kitchen management, a restaurant management like this as individual processes there. No, we would not do this because isolation is not there. And I can't dedicate the amount of resources as well. If you are deploying a single instance in a VM or a physical server, you are losing on resources. Why? Because it's good that we can fit in a load balancer or auto scale <coughs> logics can be implemented and we can scale our instances as per requirement. But when we think about the resource utilization, it becomes difficult. And one of the biggest drawbacks of VM, VF takes a lot of time to boot up. So quickly scaling on demand becomes a pain with VMs because containers would spin up in seconds. So when we want to scale a microservice residing inside a container, it scales in milliseconds, whereas in VMs it would scale in minutes. So we would go with this pattern in which inside a virtual machine, I would be running several containers. Here we have depicted one container. It's not that it would be just a single container. I can run several containers like this on the, inside the same virtual machine. And when we talk about containers, containers are isolated. If I have an auto management container, I have a kitchen management container running in the same system. They are isolated from each other. Their processes will not interfere. I can dedicate the amount of resources I need for auto management separately and kitchen management separately. So what happens? I can scale quickly because they are in containers. I have dedicated resources. All the benefits of containers can be used and I can deploy my microservices. So this is the way I would be deploying my application. And when we talk about databases, we have to keep that in mind that a database per service pattern is something people follow these days. A order service will have its own database. A customer service will have its own database. They may have the ID or the customer ID or the order ID or anything. Like if you see the customer ID is a common uh, property here, but that doesn't mean that's the primary key in that database, right? So you can have several uh, 
services looking into a single database, then it would not be a database per service pattern, but normally people prefer this way of deployment. So when we talk about monolithic applications to microservices journey, the journey is pretty vast or pretty uh, difficult. It is not uh, that easy to adapt. You will have to think about fragmenting the code. You will have to think about security. You will have to think about testing. You will have to think about, say, how to deploy the stuff. So you would have to think about how to divide the core functionalities. You would have to think about how would the messaging would be done, how the discovery would be done. So there are various dis different aspects. There are different, different patterns. The, the patterns are pretty dense. We have to pick and choose the choices from every different pattern. How I want to do testing. I want to do, do a service integration testing, every service type of testing, how I would be auditing, how I would be logging, how I would be tracing. A lot of things have to be kept in mind. So when these services are huge in number and it becomes difficult for us to manage and deploy and work with them, we package these microservices as containers, but we deploy them in Kubernetes cluster. So whenever we want to package our application as a microservice, you will have to create a containers image. And containers image can be created in an automated fashion with the help of something called as Docker file. So containers are the way of deploying an application. We would be having a uh, Docker file written and we would have several layers in it. It is nothing but a script which will have all the instructions inbuilt in it. And we would constitute the Docker image, uh, create a container image, and that container image would be deploying. Like, for example, if I take a sample Java application, I would be deploying the sample Java application by creating an image like this. If you see here, I'm executing the jar on the start of the process. So I'm saying start with an open JDK Alpine image, the container. I am adding a group called a spring, a user as a spring, and I'm switching to that user. I am setting the jar files path argument I'm setting, and I'm copying the jar file to a specific location, and I'm executing the jar. So like that, a order management jar would be separate, a kitchen management jars would be separate, a restaurant management jar would be separate. And I would have several containers like this created for individual services. And when I have multiple restaurant managements, multiple order management, management becomes really difficult. And that is when we would deploy and manage with the help of Kubernetes. We want to make our applications highly available and scalable, right? So think that this is an order management service. I would have a controller deployed over here with the help of a pod auto scaler. I can scale on demand. Like I can say that when these guys are 80% CPU utilized, I would be scaling the application into multiple instances. I can define those conditions here. I can define the min count of the containers of auto management I need. For example, minimum is three and max is say five. Whenever these instances are going 80% utilized, I would be deploying multiple instances. Fourth instance will come when this also goes 80%, fifth instance will come. And this is the guy which is nothing but the load balancer, which takes the responsibility of load balancing across instances as in when new instances of the order management gets added up, this load balancer would help us in load balancing. So we have uh, controllers in Kubernetes, which helps us manage the life cycle of uh, our containers in a better way, helps us in maintaining high availability of our application and scaling application on demand. With this, I like to show you my application dashboard let me see if it is stuck i thought so okay let me open a different console altogether so what i had done i had deployed a kubernetes cluster a aks cluster i'll show you that as well so 
So I have deployed a Kubernetes cluster called as Java Days. It is just a two node cluster and we have the same order management, the restaurant management, the kitchen management type of service. All of them would get deployed here. I've already deployed and kept it because my intention was to showcase what are the important criteria for us to keep in mind when we are transitioning our application from monolithic to microservices. I'm setting a configuration variable with which I can interact with my cluster. So this is uh, the Azure Cloud Shell, a uh, temporary server which is given for us to execute the commands and interact with our uh, console. So kubectl get all would show, I've not deployed all the microservices. One of the basic good thing about microservices is I did not have all the microservices up and running, right? When I want to deploy one of them, I can standalone test, build and deploy. So I've just deployed few of them, like the kitchen service, the consumer service, the order service, the restaurant service. So these are few of the application stuffs which are running. So the code is residing here. I would like to show you something uh, before we break for the day. So every service is having like a Docker file like this in which whatever jar we have built, we are picking up that jar and we are saying that whenever kitchen service container gets deployed, this would be the image picked up from this Docker file. So individual services would be having their own own Docker files. Like if I show you the consumer service, it will have its own Docker file like that. Every service which we talked about will have its own Docker file, which will produce an image. And then I have a file like. Let me go and look for the YAML. No, that's not the YAML file. That's a script file. Delete all, deploy all. Yeah. So when we have YAML definitions in Kubernetes, we can execute kubectl apply command and we can deploy those definition files into your uh, Kubernetes cluster so that individual services would get deployed. So let's see a few of them. If I go to food to go application, I should have an SRC folder. I want to show you the kitchen management. I'm just picking up one of the management files. I'm not sure if the font size is looking good. So you would have seen that the kitchen management pod is up and running and kitchen management service is also created in this dashboard. If we go, I should have a kitchen management service running and uh, here a load balancer is created for a kitchen management on Azure and I can reach my kitchen management service. So the IP address is 2075.37.177. This is the one. This is the page wherein I can go and I can interact with my Swagger UI. I can implement APIs here, the kitchen controller. I can have the guest get re, uh, restaurant response or ticket acceptance and all that. That can be coded here. What you would be posting, what would be the parameters, what would be the description, everything can be. For the API coding, we would be using this, right? So what I wanted to show uh, is the code. So when I want to deploy a kitchen management service, important point is I'll have a Docker file from which I'll create a kitchen management service image and that has been specified here. So a container of kitchen management would be running, which is listening on port number 8080 and it has some environment settings, some Java related spring related settings, which we have done and I've and uh, like coded a probing for the health check of my application, lightness probe, readiness probes have been coded here. I'm running one replica of it and to expose a static endpoint for this container, we have created a service. 
So this service gives a static endpoint for our kitchen management service. And herein, what I have done, I have changed the type. Like if you do kubectl get pods and you find out kubectl get pods and you find out the kitchen management service over here. So few are evicted, few are in running state. I had only one in running state. One instance was needed. So you can you can see that if one guy is troubled, others are not having any problem with it, right? So we are more interested in this kitchen management. This kitchen management is having a controller called as deployment. Let me show you this controller whose responsibility is to maintain one instance of the kitchen management pod. So if you do kubectl edit and you go and look into the deployment file, content of it, you can find that a single instance, you see this, a single replica of it is running. If I want to make it as replicas as two, that also can be done. Immediately, I want to show you how quickly containers would spin up. I'm just editing and making these replicas as two. Let's see. After applying, how many? Do you see this? Two are expected to run. One is up and running. Two are expected to run. Let me see if I have space in the cluster or. Let's do get pods and see what's the state. Can we check for the kitchen management? EA. Yeah. Both are up and running. One guy is 19 seconds up. So within seconds, I could scale and the scaling can be done on demand. I have done a manual scaling and I can reach either of the instances via that static load balancer type of IP address, which is this. And I can individually deploy my microservice. I can look into uh, individual testing of my microservices that helps us in like uh, isolating the issues which comes during a microservices development. If there is an issue, the single single pipeline which we had discussed about, like every microservice will have its own CI/CD pipeline now. And because of that CI/CD pipeline, we'll have a lot of advantages that when we are changing one of the microservices, the other microservices are not getting impacted. It's just that that single microservice is getting impacted. If I want to upgrade this to a newer version of it, I'll make code changes and I'll just deploy order service. I need not redeploy the entire application. And that's the advantage of your microservices architecture. When the failure happens, the failure would not be a single uh, whole unit failure or the whole application failure. And even the upgrade happens, if it's not that the entire application needs to be upgraded. Is it's the, the individual components, the individual microservices which needs upgrade and which needs updation over here. So I'm not going much deeper into these logics. I had uh, opened the consumer management and the kitchen management using those uh, port numbers. If you see, uh, this is the IP address and this is the port number on which my application is listening. So. I have opened with 2085.20.4 with port number 8080. In case uh, you are new to Kubernetes, uh, this would not be the correct place to start learning the stuff. So I'm just not going deeper into that. So that was all from my side. Hope I didn't shoot on time, Rashmita. Uh, no, Mamta, that's okay. We started a little late, so yeah, you're perfect on time. Thank you. So we had any questions in between or? Hi, Mamta. Uh, Vijay here. I have one question. Yeah, Vijay. Uh, suppose that if you have traffic uh, uh, hit, say, uh, more than 1,000, so how the uh, number of ports automatically increase? Where is the settings in the Kubernetes? Port will not increase. Port is not going to increase. No, I'm saying well, how will increase the instance? Currently, you are manually increased from 1 to 2. Ah. So, so be... for that, you will have to have few components. Let me just explain you that part. So I increased it manually, but in Kubernetes cluster, there is a component called as metric server. 
which has the ability to collect matrices on pod levels and on node levels as well. So my order management pods, how much of resource utilization is being done, that can be grabbed by the metric server. And this metric server is generic. It will collect information for pods of order management, kitchen management, it will do for all of them. Okay. Now, when I have a deployment, you saw that I showed you a deployment definition. This deployment has pods, the pods of their order management. Suppose three replicas were there. I would create another controller called as horizontal pod autoscaler in which I will define the condition. And this horizontal pod autoscaler's responsibility is to go and pick the resource utilization of order management, check this condition, and min and max count. Suppose min was three, max is five. If this condition is hit, it will say deployment, hey, scale to one more replica. So from three, it will become four. From four, it will become five. For that, you need this component to be there. Metric server is already running, but per application, like per microservice, I would have to create a horizontal pod. Hope that answers your question, Vijay. Yeah, Manta. Yeah, thank you. Yep. One more question here in this regard, the same. So we have, uh, say, five, five instances running uh, across that Kubernetes clusters. Now I want to push all the logs from these instances in, uh, into a common, uh, say, log server. So how to manage uh, you this? You want to push uh, I want to push all the logs instances? from these instances to a common server. Uh, so in Kubernetes cluster, suppose these pods are running. Pods may be running in different different workloads. The two pods of order management are running here. Two pods of order management are running here. One pod of order management is running here. I would have agents on the node level who would be collecting information. You can use uh, services of Azure Monitor in which you have container insights and all. You can do that or you can deploy your own uh, monitoring and logging services as well. These agents work is to collect information or logs from all the pods which are running in this. And then I would be say like, for example, have you heard about Elk Stack? Elasticsearch, Log Stash, Kibana? Uh, ELK you are talking yeah. about, yeah. 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 So Log Stash agents like metrics or uh, metrics collecting agent or log collecting agent would collect that logs and give it to Log Stash. Log Stash is also running as a container somewhere. That would transform and give it to Elasticsearch. For example, Elasticsearch is running here. And my Kibana dashboard is also running in one of the nodes in the cluster. So I am logging into Kibana dashboard, running a query, which is going and grabbing the information from the Elasticsearch. And all these agents are sending their data to the same log stash. Log stash is pushing and it is saving the data in the Elasticsearch sync. So all data, whether it is five instances, whether it is 10 instances, whether it is a single instance, whether it is of order management, whether it is of kitchen management, every data would be residing here only. And you can see that from a single view from the Kibana's dashboard. Yeah, I've got it. So it means uh, we have to, uh, I mean, specify the agent uh, uh, download in the image uh, itself. So, there are different ways of doing it. If you want an agent on an application level, you will have to make a container run inside your application itself. There would be two containers inside a pod. One would be your application container, one would be your agent container, or you can deploy the agent on a node level. Both the ways are there. Either of the ways can be chosen. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yep. So I have a question, uh, Mamta. So, have you used Ingress controller in your code? In this code that you showed. Ingress controller would be used, uh, like for example. Mostly for the routing kind of stuff, right? Yes. So, if I have order management, hmm. that also is exposed outside, for example. And if I have consumer management, that is also exposed outside. And uh, suppose mine is food2go.com. 
slash order if you go it will take you to order management if you take food to go.com slash consumer it will take you to the consumer management mm. then in that case i can have a ingress controller here and i can write ingress rules okay mm. yeah like when you hit this it will send it to this instance when you hit this it will send it to this instance both the request will get routed to the seed load balancer and from there because this is layer 7 load balancer right it has the intelligence of opening packet and looking where exactly you want to route it this guy would look into this rule book two rules would be written tomorrow if i have kitchen management then i'll have one more rule added into this rule book for the kitchen management as well and depending on what payload is coming i would be routing the request to that particular instance yeah thank you In Kubernetes world, is there anything something like uh, the resource itself uh, increase automatically? Something anything like that? Resource on the pod level? Uh, anything like, for example, I am running a uh, cloud only like a two GB memory. I am running. Okay. Suddenly it wants to increase to three GB. That the load is coming increasing the load. So like that, so I have. When you increase the load, you can do two things. Either you can instantiate more instances of that container. or you can grab more resources for that container so horizontal scaling or vertical scaling both are supported okay but for that we need to uh, make a note correct right? in the deployment yes, you would have to specify the condition and you would have to create a controller component and keep it ready okay Thanks. so definition has to be done by you kubernetes provides yeah, 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 it. definition has to be provided by you but uh, uh sorry for this issue it won't automatically increase right automatic scaling of the resources would happen if you have created that component if you have not created it will not do oh okay so basically i need to write some conditions like if it is exists uh, coming at most 1.75 by gb immediately i need to increase uh, one uh, one gb extra time true true that definition of that condition and all you have to define that and how intelligently you define your application would behave that intelligent um uh, scaling resources is scaling uh, instances which one was better than why did you choose one uh, scaling resources was a scaling the instances so scaling uh, the instances would be chosen uh, higher than scaling the uh, resources instances can scale up to any limit till the time we have resources in the entire cluster but if i try to scale the resources there would be an upper limit on that particular virtual machine right hitting that is much more quicker than the number of instances so vertical scaling is less preferred than horizontal scaling okay thank you so is there any use case that you see for communication between services right the ideal way would be event based communication right but do you have any use case where a uh, hybrid mode of communication can also be considered instead of uh, event based communication hybrid in the sense what other ways like so uh, for example in our application right in, in where i work for example what happens is there is one application that uh, there is one microservice that calls the other one mm -hmm. okay. so initially uh, the service the microservice that is being called let's say a payment service right you would mm -hmm. actually send synchronous response saying that you know accepted a request or you know so, so then it would be marked as a pending state and then my, uh, this microservice my, uh, the, the payment service would actually contact some other service right you know an external service and it would actually get a deferred response from there correct okay. after which it it would actually push that event into an into the azure event hub and then the originating service would pick it up and mark the transaction as successful correct you know so, so for call level there would be multiple uh, ways of communicating mm -hmm. for you like payment service is sending an indication and just not waiting there 
uh, because payment service will take some time to complete the payment, go through the gateway, and then the response will come, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. The client is not waiting over there. That is an asynchronous communication. If something can happen, like for example, if you're booking a Ola cab, okay? Mm -hmm. When you start scanning for a Ola cab, it first authorizes, authenticates you and checks the authorization, whether I'm valid to use a Excel cab or not, right? In yeah. such cases, the response comes immediately. If I'm not authorized to book, book an Excel cab or some specific type of cab under my corporate account, it would mm. immediately respond me. But if so that it, would be synchronous. Yeah, that would be synchronous. But when uh, uh, intimation goes to the driver, five drivers have been one too many communication has happened. We have done a broadcast hmm. and whichever driver responds back, then yeah. that driver would be allocated to me. Right. So the entire flow would be combination of different, different types of messaging. Sometimes hmm. asynchronous, sometimes one to one, sometimes one too many. Sometimes there is a queue. One guy is publishing there. Other guys picking up. Or in the queue also you are publishing, there are five subscribers to that queue. Everyone is waiting for it. Like order management, kitchen guy is waiting, the consumer guy is waiting, the uh, courier guy is waiting. Everyone is waiting for the order ID to get created. So everyone has subscribed to the single queue which is residing there. So always it would be like a combination of uh, communication. It can't be a single type of communication can be used. Okay. Thank you. Hope that helps. Example helps you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Hey all, um, and, and Mamta will be here. And if you have any questions, just type in your questions as well. Yeah. Um, we have next speaker waiting. Yeah. So I'll we'll just continue. unshare my screen, uh, Vivek. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Mamta, much. for such an amazing session. Thank you. Thank you. And we have our next uh, speaker, Arvind, with us, who will be, you know, taking session on building and tracing a Java application on Azure container instances. Over to you, Arvind. Hey, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, that was really nice session. I was hearing uh, Mamta because I was li really looking out uh, for all the microservice uh, services and all. You explained very well. In fact, I felt uh, I don't know a lot, and uh, I really feel amazed now. Uh, maybe a blog or a YouTube channel or something. You should definitely talk more about this very often, so that that should really help. So yeah, thank you again. So I'll just share my screen. Uh, that should be okay. This one. Uh, can you see my screen, uh, Vivek? And uh, yes, 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 we can. Oh, okay, great. So I don't have so many slides. I I just want to keep it uh, pretty simple. And I'll, I have only a bit of uh, demo that we will look through. And um, the idea here is to get started, uh, learn something. And so and also like take take some code with you at the end of the session and then you could implement it in your leisure or like, you know, try it, try it as well. Um, so that's the overall goal. And uh, I know it is really difficult, like uh, like Pamta was talking about Kubernetes and, you know, and, and a lot of concepts and there are things that probably sometimes it will not be able to explain in a conference talk, but uh, we could give you resources and you could go back and work on it. So that's my goal here today to explain you with all of that. So I hope you're all keeping well. I wish you all, uh, I mean, you know, uh, my best wishes to everyone because it, it's really tough uh, for a lot of people, whatever ha is happening uh, and going through their life. And I, I only want to like, you know, uh, take few minutes and like, you know, give a lot of info for you. So I am Arvind. Uh, if someone don't know me, uh, I work at Elastic as a developer advocate, but um, uh, I also like uh, take part in the open source communities. Uh, and then I work with a lot of uh, community folk over here uh, with different uh, beat uh, cloud native technologies or Apache Software Foundation. Uh, and uh, I also blog at Arvind.dev. And I have a YouTube channel on the same name, like you know, Arvind Kutrevu, and uh, you could go and see. I, I do interviews with a few other folks uh, and on the meta stuff, not not so boring stuff like coding and all, but then uh, talking about code and like their experience, etc. So, so yeah, the key takeaways of the session is we will see how Elastic Stack works, and we all will also see the tracer, the 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 APM tracer with a Java application. 
so the context here is uh, Java applications, but you could also apply to this to anywhere. But uh, we have a Java agent, and I want to demonstrate and show some features there, uh, take you through some code. Uh, I guess uh, most of you know Elastic Stack, but if not, I will give you a brief primer as well. So Elastic Stack basically, uh, like uh, like Mamda was telling previously, is Elk Stack, like you know E L K, like you have Elastic Search, Log Stash, and Kibana. Uh, wherein uh, used for different different use cases. Uh, pe some people use it as a their backend, uh, like a NoSQL data store. Some people use it like uh, what do you call um, like a search engine. Some people use it for their you know log analytics metrics. And this is whatever we are talking about is using it for application tracing and profiling. Uh, you you get that data, and we have ingestion technologies that enable you to ship all of this. So Logstash and Beats are the ingestion modules through which you can pull data or push data into Elasticsearch. And uh, Kibana is the UI which is sitting on top of Elasticsearch. It is stateless. Elasticsearch is a stateful system. It's a distributed system. Okay. And Logstash is again a, 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 a ETL tool. Like it can collect data, transform it, and load it to a different place. So it's it's a uh, it's kind of like your Informatica or, or exterior stuff. It has a lot of plugins uh, and you know the, the you can also develop a plugin to your custom data source, etc. And beats as you know, like again, uh, previous speaker was saying about uh, how do you collect metrics from prods and also you could install metric beat, file beat, audit beat, these beats and can collect data. We're also making progress to bring in a unified beat, uh, which is called as elastic agent through which we could do all of that. So that that is the overall open source or like the free and open stack that you have here. And uh, we are going a bit more than whatever is is given here. So let us spin up this stack in a cloud so that you know uh, it's easy for us to. By the time we come back to the demo, it's easy for us to get started. So I am using Elastic Cloud, but you could also go to download download dot elastic dot co and download Elastic Search Kibana and all. It will take a bit more time, so I'm just using this thing here. So I'm using the observability deployment. Uh, I'll choose Azure and I'll choose Singapore. Uh, just nearby and then uh, I'll just name it as observable uh, the observability deployment. I have I have a you know I could go and like kind of create it using a Terraform or something. But uh, again, you could customize you could change the how much amount of data that you could store at all. So we're not going with the, we're going with the default deployment here. Uh, while this gets created, uh, let's come back and then uh, we'll we'll also discuss some theory and come back and then like look into that deployment as well so i've created this stack here whatever i'm showing here i created this here there and uh, and i also have one more additional component that i'm going to discuss uh, now so there are like i said this previous stack the stack that i spoke can be molded into different shapes so it's like a clay that you can mold it to accommodate a search engine or like a logs metrics phrases uptime synthetics uh, real user monitoring kind of use cases or you could also use it for threat hunting you could use it for various stuff like that so that is these three are three different areas uh, that that you could potentially look at but it it, is a, it has a common backend uh, stack is used by de uh, developers devops professionals practitioners uh, you know product owners uh, for monitoring whether their application is doing in the right time scrum owners all of them people use it for a wide variety of use cases and it is platform agnostic. You could also deploy it on uh, Kubernetes, which we are not talking now. Uh, but uh, there are many talks that have been uh, on the similar platform. Uh, you could go and check that running Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. So, but what is APM? I guess by this time, some of you who are in the industry and like probably uh, working on Java would definitely know profiling. Might have tried uh, getting heap dumps. Uh, tried looking at uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, sorry. OK, fine. Uh, so basically you might be knowing about um, APM uh, or, or profiling in general, like the JVM profiling using Java Flight Recorder or Visual VM or your Kit or something. Profiling is again different and APM, whatever we are talking about is application uh, performance man management. Um, so what basically it does is it collects metrics, traces and various interesting information from your application and shows you how it works uh, when in especially in a microservice environment like Mamta was talking about multiple consumer different different of microservices each uh, probably each API is handled by a service and uh, in some cases there are only few services written in a few uh, specific language other services written in a different language altogether 
or you are integrating with a third party system where there are APIs. So how does that work? So how does how does the data sharing work? How do you what is the what is the performant one? What is not performing? What, where are the errors? So it becomes more and more complex, even though you are having advantages like uh, uh, like you know reliability, scalability, and you know deployability. All of these are in, in getting increased because it's also getting decentralized. It's not like one huge monolith. Uh, so that way, it is kind of helpful for you to uh, like deploy microservices at the same point of time. There is a bit of complexity in managing this thing and your developer productivity might go long or less. So that is why you need something like an APM. Uh, so it collects traces, it, it does profiling, it, it shows all of this information. Uh, yeah, OK, I, I, I showed I could have shown this side. So basically a simple, simple one request that I could uh, show here is like you have a client, you have a uh, you know, application or a database or some sort of uh, engine, and then you kind of like ask something and you get details like you want to understand like why it took eight seconds. I mean, this is some sort of a uh, meetings or standups that we regularly sit in, right? When like, why is this taking so much time? How can we improve? Right? At the same time, like sometimes you receive errors uh, like internal server error or null pointer exception, but you can't reproduce in house. You you can't also put a debug point in the production cluster, right? So or a production system. So how do you find out that particular stuff? So your developer productivity is really getting an improvement uh, when when you are using tools like this. Uh, basically, it does a request response flows, response type percentiles, errors and bug tracking. Um, yeah, I'll show all of that actually. So why so impro important? Uh, like I I literally told the story, but I'll also explain you again. Suppose if there is a user who is construct uh, who is who is interacting, uh, you know, uh, and then like uh, I mean, if if you are a developer and you are if you have deployed your code onto a cloud, a Java application, and then the user is interacting with it, either the user is seeing an error or user is seeing a warning or uh, user is seeing say something like uh, it is rotating, it's taking a lot of time. So then user complains or like user user might close your tab and user might not know what happens. Then if you use a technology or like a tooling thing like uh, tracing, what happens is like you could ship all of the metrics to a backend store and then you as a developer, you understand what's happening in your app every moment. And there are there are many interesting things that happened over a period of time where where food delivery companies found out that uh, it, it uh, APMs could really help in their order penetration. Like, you know, why the orders are falling through, uh, like, you know, when it is hitting a specific peak, then they found out that the payment system can only scale to a certain extent. After that, it is rejecting the request. So there are some things like that that could that could leverage and improve your business altogether. Uh, if you are a product owner, you should definitely take a look at this thing. And moreover that you also have uh, you are not like so, uh, work, uh, working in a silo. You are also having uh, you, uh, a combination of your logs, metrics, and uh, your application traces. Like you are not just looking at your logs. You are looking at your request trace itself. How it executed? What are the parameters that ha that has been executed? So that's what a trace contain. Uh, uh, I'll show you a trace, but uh, I'm I'm taking an advantage and like explaining you all of that. So this is an, an interesting convergence where you have all of this. So. Uh, Elastic has an Elastic APM uh, product, which is a completely open source product, and then we have a, a ton of uh, agents and we support ton of programming languages, and all of this is like open source. You could go and uh, contribute to it, and uh, and like um, if if you could raise issues and you could ask uh, features as well. Uh, there are ton of things that are already supported in the Java agent, multiple frameworks, multiple web servers, multiple application servers, and a lot of these things. It's powered by ByteBuddy. We also actively contribute to that. And uh, and then like there are three different models to attach. We are going to see one specific model, uh, and there are also like uh, you know it it also supports multiple intermediate systems so that you can track and understand what's happening in that system. Uh, like yeah, so so yeah, I've, I've gone a bit fast to come to this place, and then like we'll go and see the demo. So uh, we're going to build a Spring Boot JPA uh, based uh, MySQL application. And then I have the code ready and then we'll build a Docker image, push it to the Azure container registry and then push it to the Azure container instances. And I mean, create a Azure con container instance based on the image that we pushed in the container registry. And then we'll access it to the user. If possible, we'll try to run, uh, you know, a uh, 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 Postman collection agent and like, you know, hit the API and see how uh, if really a uh, certain amount of requests are coming, how does the app perform? So that's what we are going to do. So you're going to learn a bit of everything and then you're going to see at the end you get a code. So 
let us see how it's done. OK, so I have in, in the interest of time, I have created a database uh, for I mean, I am using MySQL here and I'm using Azure database for MySQL servers. I don't want to like, you know, deploy and start a service and run it all myself and I'm just using the service here. So I've created a uh, MySQL server. Uh, how do you do that? Basically, you click on new and it finds out, uh, you know, a, a single server. You could also you go with multiple options which are more suitable for production, but I'm using the single server here. Choose a resource group and then give a server name like you know test and then you choose the set. You choose the region. I chose uh, the South South Asia like OK, sir. Test. OK. I think uh, it should be there. Yes, great. So then you have the type of uh, the the server. It's general purpose, so I chose basic. And then I also chose uh, the storage to like you know 5 GB. I don't think I will store much of data here, so I just stored it 5 GB. And then two pros, and uh, and then I went ahead and like you know created. Uh, I, I didn't enable anything, and like I created this service. So so yeah, that's what is here. I also gave the username password uh, and uh, the user name is spring and the password is a specific pass string that I show you there. And uh, I have also enabled a firewall uh, you know, rule to allow uh, Microsoft, I mean the other services to connect to this particular thing like it's called connection security. If you go and say it's like allow Azure services to connect, yes. And I also have enabled my own laptop to connect so that we could try the system in if, if you want to try the app locally you could try doing that uh, so i i made some changes hope it works and let us see uh, if demo gods are in our favor today and um, one more thing you could do all of this by using the azure cli um, and you could create the cluster create the create the azure uh, uh, mysql cluster here you could also enable the firewall rule you could add a client group ip i didn't do all of that i use the ui but we'll still be using uh, the Azure thing for you know connecting to the database and creating a database uh, or dropping a database because MySQL needs a database, right? So we already have. So I I already have that database type, but I'll show you the commands as well. I hope I'm not going too fast, but if you feel that I'm fast and like you know you can you can you know ask me questions because I want to take as many as questions. Also show you everything. The code I have it here. Uh, I have uh, I have. Uh, multiple samples here so you could go and look at the sample that I'm given here. Um, I have checked it out and uh, but you could also I will give you the link so that you could also check it out. So. I have opened this in the Visual Studio code and um, this is this is the app that is there in the GitHub and uh, so if you see here I have a simple web controller and I have a attendance tracker application which which has uh, some basic information doesn't have anything special. Uh, we'll come back to this particular guy, uh, but then uh, I have a student repository which interacts with the student table and I have students.java which contains uh, first name and last name. Not so much crazy here like I just have that and then um, how does the table schema look at like I have a create table table name and uh, I also have uh, some application properties and also log log based properties Look, I have some specific way how the logs have to be shipped um, that you could use it later to correlate between the traces and uh, other stuff. Uh, we're not doing that today, but then I, I have left it and checked it out inside. And then um, I also have this uh, application properties here. Like if you see here, I have the Hibernate SQL to be set to the debug so that we see the logs. And then I have the JDBC URLs as I have shown you here that this is a server name of the SQL. And uh, this is the database that we have created. Uh, like, say, for example, to start with MySQL, you definitely need to have uh, uh, you have a database. So I have the resource group. Uh, the name of the database is Tracker. I want to create, and then I have the server name as the server name that we have seen. So this is the database that I have created, and uh, and then like uh, and then like I have this uh, specific username and password. And I'm also using uh, create drop as the DDL auto uh, specification. That means every time I start the data, uh, start the app, the tables will be created. And uh, once I close the app, close the app, that it will be dropped before the application is being shut down. This is not recommended for your production workloads, but this is I'm just using uh, because of the demo purpose. So just to keep reminded of it. Any questions? Are you are you sharing anything? I can see the GitHub page. That's it. Oh, okay. same 
Okay, sorry. I guess uh, then something is wrong. I'll just share the screen one. Is it is it uh, available now? I mean, like, is it? Can you see this now? Yeah, I see the Visual Studio. Okay, great. I'll I'll just come back again. So basically, I have uh, checked out this code into Visual Studio Code, and I'm just explaining the same thing. I have uh, the web controller, and um, and then like um, I have the attendance trackers, uh, student repository, and uh, students entity here. Uh, a student repository is like just a, a interacting with a, a table that is there here. Uh, the table uh, definition is here, and then uh, uh, in the MySQL we have created uh, the we have created the a, a database with the name tracker. So this is the command I'm using the AGCLI uh, to create this one. Um, it 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 takes a bit of time, so I'm just fast forwarding so that we could come to the real deal. Uh, so so the infrastructure some of it has been created, but then the app and everything has not been deployed. So this is how uh, this entire thing would look like. And then um, I have the web in the web controller. I have two specific endpoints. One is the general uh, you hit the website and you see all the data. And the other one is like wherein you kind of like hit this particular uh, URL to deploy you to push to save the to save the data object in the data. So that's what is happening here. Um, and then um, I have in the form.xml also you see uh, not much, but a bunch of uh, the, the Azure. I mean like the Spring Boot starter for JPA and you also see the MySQL connector so that it connects to the MySQL and nothing much. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's it. That, that's it about the application itself. And uh, I also explained the application properties here. So these are the properties that I have. Like I have a data source URL. Um, I have the uh, like you know the ad the address to connect to the specific uh, MySQL server and the password, and then um, I'm just uh, using the create drop as a DDL auto command so that like you know it drops the database every time uh, the app gets restarted. So this is just for the demo purpose, but usually don't use it in the real world. So now let us quickly kind of like run this one in the in the in my in my, in my laptop. I hope this is visible, but I'm just making it bigger. Uh, is it visible to you guys? Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 So it says a uh, Spring Boot data center is initialized and it's connected. Let us go to localhost 8080 and uh, see if uh, things work. Right. It, it's it's there. And then it should throw me an error if I say OK, because I'm not get is not allowed because it's a post mapping. So I have uh, I have postman up already. Uh, let us simply do. Uh, I hope you could see the screen as well, right? Because I'm just make, I'm just uh, making sure that you could see the screen. Yes, okay. so if you do a simple get, you should see empty. And then uh, students, I'm just pushing the data into the same uh, the the Microsoft Azure this thing, but I haven't deployed anything. I haven't created anything. So uh, I just have the body and then select it as raw. I'm just using this instead of curl because uh, it's it's bit if it's a bit easy and it also like uh, makes it uh, you makes for you to understand a bit better. So that's why I'm using uh, Azure. So just use it. Great and select the JSON. Let us see if it works. So yeah, so it has created the record. And then if I go back and change it to get, and I should be able to see this. It's, it's simple. It's not so crazy. Um, it's it's easier. And then um, now we'll stop the app and again uh, kind of like you know. Uh, when when I stop it, it it, it starts deleting. It it it, rem it removes the table, C drop table effect. The students it will fire that query and delete that data. Um, so so this is how uh, I have built an application. Now if I want to trace this application, now if I want to uh, understand what's happening in this application when I'm interacting with that. So how do you go around and do that? So basically you have the APM agent from Elastic and through which you can put that in multiple ways through. To start tracing this application. So one way is to use the Java agent flag and put that uh, the jar in the in the place. And like when you are building the container, when you are starting the container in the Docker file, 
and you give a java agent flag and give the jar jar file here and it'll automatically pick that jar and start instrumenting your application uh, but uh, what the, the method i used here is a bit different uh, it's called the programmatic attach wherein it attaches uh, to the specific process and starts tracing the application so how does it know that which server to connect and send the traces so i have application elastic apm dot uh, properties if you see here i have this particular deployment uh, that is already connected i have a specific thing called secret token i could give these details from the newer deployment and then it will start shipping traces to that uh, you could also specifically tell which apm which packages that you want to monitor like i am using aca apm i could just use aca apm web and it will only look at the web specific stuff and this is the service same that we'll see what what uh, what reason that i am using the service name here so i guess uh, everything is clear but then if you have any questions please write in the uh, write in the chat or please ask i mean in between i'm happy to help as well so meanwhile we'll get the we'll get the you know the the details from the deployment that we had created in the first any so questions this, uh, this elastic apm properties which you showed right is it like the default thing that the spring boot uh, picks up uh, just like how we have application or properties right which is a default one so is it like a default name that is automatically picked up yes so what it does is like uh, it it automatically picks up uh, the suppose if it's in the resources it will pick up automatically and then uh, app, uh, takes all the details from this particular uh, standard keys that are there so it will look for it actually mm -hmm. um, if it is not and if you are using uh, say for example if you are using in the command line using java agent you could also specify the same properties here uh, with hyphen d command and give the same key and uh, details and everything and it'll start shipping uh, most people use that because the reason is uh, uh, they don't want to change the code they don't want to add any extra line of code or they can't do it but they could restart the app with this particular flag uh, most people use that particular you know you you write hyphen java agent and then colon and like give the jar file location and then uh, even sometimes if you have the same properties file where the jar file is located jar it will automatically pick up from that properties the jar file will try to look in for that if you don't have then the jar i mean it will not connect to it your app will not be disturbed uh, by adding this agent actually we will not stop your agent so we will not stop your app uh, uh, by by using this agent if it doesn't start it doesn't start that's it okay so specifically i have created this deployment and you have all of this you have apart from the stack the elastic search and kibana you see apm you don't see logstash and beats uh, because uh, first of all you don't you don't need logstash and um, in general to pull the data and beats not there because we are not collecting any logs from infrastructure if not if then we need to install that not here so you have elastic search kibana and apm so apm is the one that receives all the data and then like uh, makes it a document and puts the traces in a single format when you have multiple services we will also do that so i'm just going to like you know go to the apm and uh, you know copy the endpoint and paste it here in the apm property so that we deploy to the the one that we kind of like recently did and then uh, copy the token server service secret token and then like paste it here and then um, we'll just simply uh, bun bundle the app and then like you know uh, push it to make it a container and push it to it you could also try to look at the same data if i could run it manually like you know let us let us do that anyway let us do that so it's easier to find it locally than again shipping all the way through the pipeline and like finding it oh it didn't work so any question meanwhile So for APM, uh, uh, sorry, for APM, uh, do you have some uh, the in the POM there is a dependency, or you directly apply the jar file? Okay, I, I think it, it because I the screen. Yeah. So uh, there are two ways. Like, like I said, you could download this from the Maven, the agent from the Maven central jar, and keep it in your root and use the Java agent flag to give the location and do all of that. But uh, you could also use the POM dot XML and add this dependency. And uh, use the programmatic attach uh, mode to just refer that and then use it. That's it. So both ways are there. Uh, in the controller, do you have uh, given any annotation to let uh, to this API? No, controller, I don't have anything. Oh. Uh, you could do it. Uh, so suppose if you want a specific uh, method or a endpoint to be only traced. 
and you don't want uh, I, I don't give packages but i want only specific that to be done i could use that uh, a specific an an annotation to trace the to trace that particular method more deeply uh, so i understand i collect more trace samples so again the sampling is done in this particular thing it's not like everything is collected it's like uh, it's like a specific sample is being collected you can set that sample rate sampling rate as well don't collect everything like currently it is defaulted to one second but you if it if it is more like for example i have seen use cases wherein people collect maybe 25 to 30 gb of data uh, for like having a, a a lot of users in the on the app so it, it will start collecting more and more data you might not need all of that but you want to identify specific services maybe only deploy there so yeah great so i guess uh, i just uh, i just started the app i didn't request i didn't do anything let us see if it is if it did connect to the 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 elastic agent that we have shipped here like if you see here let me make it a bit bigger and close this one so if you see here it says uh, somewhere okay i missed it ah okay so it says here uh, elastic apm remote config folder info and says like new receive new configuration from the service and um, it says that it is uh, specifically configured to this particular to connect to this particular service so it says uh, if you see here no active uh, profile set and then it says like um, you know uh, yeah health check it's available build it so and so so and so so and so it is so i have all of this ready so we just need to start accessing the app and start generating some requests so that you know the the thing gets traced so i'll start accessing the app and then we'll see if it really works so if I click last 15 minutes, it should show the attendance tracker. We just tried one and uh, and then because we didn't have any data, it, it should show everything as empty and it doesn't have any specific uh, calls or anything that we explicitly made. It's only a single call and shows MySQL, how much time MySQL took. Let us not take this for uh, granted. It's also from the local computer that I have made. So let us leave that. And then let us quickly go back and uh, you know kind of uh, deploy it on the cloud. Uh, so I'm just stopping the stopping the stopping the application, and we'll build the container. So building container might take a bit of time. Uh, I'm using a Docker locally. I'm not building on the Azure. Building on Azure will take a bit more time. So I'm going to use the student as a tag, and then uh, uh, it should it should make it easy. Uh, I shouldn't have uh, actually deleted the I, I deleted thinking that OK, it, it's anyway there. It's cached, so it should be free and easy. It takes a bit of time to build this Docker container and then I am using a bunch of extensions here. VS Code extensions are very really helpful. Uh, whatever cloud that you work, whatever service that you work, there are the ecosystem is really great here. So I'm using the Docker container through which you could connect your registries. So I have a container registry created in uh, named devdish in the in the in the Azure. So it is the devdish.acr.io. It's a public uh, registry, and then I'm pushing this image to that. Going to push this image, but primarily currently it is building in my local. And uh, once it is there, I'll use this uh, command to push it to the Azure, uh, like in you know, an Azure container registry. And once it is there, I'll use the Azure container instances to create it. All of them can be done by commands. All of them can be used uh, in different different ways. What uh, you could also use it in the pipelining kind of a, if you have a specific you want as when as and when you want to push some code, you want to trigger this process. You could do all of that. I'm just using you know a, a standard methodology something that makes us easy to demonstrate as well so any other questions uh, in meanwhile so arvin uh, i could see that in that uh, uh, the apm properties you have shared that uh, server url uh, from Correct. where you can ship the, uh, the 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 matrices so in the real life uh, that should not be uh, hard coded because so dynamically, the server uh, location will change some uh, server. I mean, uh, location will change in the internet network. So how to deal with that? No, no. See, uh, you always have one deployment, right? So this server is your uh, servers which server which collect the traces. Now we have uh, multiple availability zones behind the server. So this is like an FQD, and I could I didn't show you all of that. Um, so I could set up an alias here, like you know, an endpoint alias. I could create an endpoint alias and like you know set up something like you know Azure Java Day. Of course, this should be available in this region. 
but if i select it says edge your tower day so and so so and so and i could use these endpoints in that and apart from that if you see here apart from that you have uh, multiple availability zones for the same server like uh, this 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 uh, this particular deployment is having in two different zones and then uh, suppose in case of any issue what happens is like we automatically switch it switch it to a different zone and like you still have some uh, you know cluster uptime being guaranteed so that way it is foolproof of course we recommend you to go through uh, uh, the review and then like you know uh, and then like have properly configured system and setting but uh, but it is not, not have this particular url um, if you are deploying locally like say if you have an elastic search cluster and then like you are deployed an apm server in say azure vm and then um, you are pushing the data then i agree it might be a problem because you need to make sure that the apm server is up all the time because you are the responsible person for running uh, the reliability of the service that is in the azure vm so that is that is the thing to observe i hope you got my point yeah yeah okay thanks currently it is it is properly managed but then definitely it it is something that to be looked over from the architecture point of view so any other questions so the the unique thing of you know, like on current trending uh, top rated apm tools yeah they, there are there are many apm tools uh, elastic apm is uh, the open source one and uh, you also have uh, open telemetry which is very popular uh, wherein you have agents and then uh, uh, the any any vendor should like any vendor who is having apm uh, should accept that uh, you know the should come to a compatible with that particular open telemetry exporter and it automatically start uh, getting stuff uh, so that is one one another uh, popular uh, tracing tool that is that is available here and then you obviously have eager uh, which does great traces from the cncf um, there are there are many projects that have merged to become open source open telemetry as well uh, open tracing is there zipkin is there so there are multiple projects that are there uh, the only thing is like in this entire tracing world which i am actually telling before what the question that you have asked is um, is like correlation between your logs metrics and traces so now just we are looking at collecting the traces but once you have this running in a large scale environment like with multiple micro microservices and you want to be able to find out an application trace linked to a, a log that is generated in a pod uh, or in a container that you have right you want to be able to find out how what is the what is a heap size or like say what is not even heap size what is the cpu at this uh, in this particular uh, infrastructure when i hit this issue is this a hardware issue or is this something that i could increase the resource and get rid away so all of these are the things that you probably need to look at as well so that's where uh, correlation makes important there are like open telemetry everyone is trying to do the same thing uh, in in a way so let me come back so i guess uh, i have okay i guess i have pushed the image uh, to the local uh, image center so let me refresh and see okay you see that i have decently pushed it and then let me try to push it to the the azure container registry that i showed showed here i am pushing it azure student latest um so as you could see that it is trying to push the image and i will show you how it is really in the portal um so i'm using container registries and uh, i guess this is not needed so you will get a registry so you could create multiple registries but inside the registries you have repositories and this is just like docker hub but your own private docker hub your organization's own private docker hub you could make it public as well um, and let uh, publicly uh, people take it take advantage of it but then uh, you if you want to use it internally uh, within your network you could do that as well so i have this uh, student thing that uh, just shipped i guess yeah so i have this latest uh, image and then you could use docker pull so and so to start uh, this thing uh, so at this point to deploy it and on the cloud i could click on run instance uh, but this is very dramatic and like what i don't know why it's happening in the azure like it doesn't give you my, give me full uh, full features uh, to configure my instance so i i could just uh, go new new container instance and then uh, i could build it 
uh, while we are selecting this, I want to also talk about this particular uh, technology, uh, container instances. Unlike your serverless, uh, you know, your serverless deployments, uh, wherein you want to write a function uh, to do some specific in a thing, container instance let you bring the developer bring their own tooling. Like you could take your own environment and you could run it in a serverless fashion. So we are using Java here. You could use Quarkus. Uh, we are using Spring Boot here. You could use Spring Native, which recently came in, or Quarkus, or you know, uh, all of these tools like you know Micronaut, these uh, native services, and you would get massive amount of like you know performance benefits. And uh, or or else you could use any other language as well. But the need of the R is to like you know you could bring in your own tooling, you could manage your own container, uh, but you run it in a serverless fashion. You only be charged for the the amount of CPU and otherwise it's usually set to zero or something like that. So there are many, many pricing and feature related stuff that is that is interesting here. You should definitely take a look at container instances. This entire spectrum is really interesting. This area of deploying the applications through Docker and doing it. There are many, many new things that are coming in. You should keep up up with that actually. So I chose that resource group. The container name could be anything. I'm choosing uh, student. This is not uh, something that you know uh, the image name. I could choose something else as well, but I chose student. Um, I am not going to deploy from the quick start images. I'm going to use my container registry because I have one. It is showing here, and I'm using the image. You have multiple tags. You could that all of that will be shown, and then I'm not changing anything here. Next, coming to the networking, you will get a uh, you will get a good alias like a say. A fully qualified domain name, you will get that. So you say student dot South India dot Azure container dot let us do Azure Java day. So will it be there? Yeah, it's there. So and I'm also enabling 8080 port. You could you could choose to do it differently by uh, using a doing a port mapping in the uh, Docker container as well. I I don't want to uh, you know do that. I just want to show this particular feature and then like do it. So I'll just create click create as everything is configured. Um, yeah. So let me go and see that. Can you hear me? I didn't get that. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Okay, yes. sorry. Something happened and then I thought like I, I don't have power. Great. So the deployment is in progress and then um, you all could also access it. The cherry on the pick is like you, you could you could also access it and uh, try sending requests. And uh, we will also run a collection, Postman collection on top of the, the data that we have here. So Postman collection, I I guess if you haven't used it, it's simple. It's like uh, uh, you, you could run a specific collection to kind of like uh, do the same sort of, uh, uh, what do you call, run the same sort of request again and again. I'm just going to remove the post one because uh, maybe it's not needed, but I'm going to do the get one. So it keeps asking, getting the information from the from the system. So I will run it with a delay of uh, two millisecond each request and uh, or like, yeah, make it three and write a thousand iterations like uh, uh, like keep thousand iterations and remove the variable values because I don't want to use anything. I just want to show the data and like, you know, show everything. So let me come back. The deployment is complete. Go to resource and then you should find this. Uh, ideally, it should show the empty symbol, right? It's, it's showing nothing. So once uh, let us uh, do this particular, you know, like let us post it and uh, body is raw json uh, the same thing that we used previously i could have kept that request but i deleted it and then i'll write my name and, uh, you can see in the can history, see. in history it should be there i i, I just want to, yeah you're right i just want to like don't know how thing to do that so 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 this way, like you could test also in a way that uh, you could uh, choose everything. So I'm just using this particular students. You could do a curl call as well. So that is that is decent. OK, so it's saying student. I think I chose two dents here. That's why it is not finding. Let me say maybe. Oh, sorry. I use Java days. Right? Sorry. OK, Java days. So it should store the data and then I have some data now and it's going to every time I, I run this particular stuff, it's going to call and like get me some data. 
so let us run this uh, collection and then it will start okay i think uh, the collection won't run because again it is student it should be azure java days so let me edit it and then rerun it again so that uh, we will we will save and then then i could run this and then publish will show this thousand and three millisecond remove everything hopefully oh it's not updated right i guess okay let me do this okay and uh, okay save so I, I just edited the same stuff so that's why it is not working uh, i don't know why it's still showing this thing it's not updated or the runner is old maybe yeah run yes so what i run should start uh, doing this information and then i could go back to see uh, whether our uh, the, the the application that we are tracing have received any information or not. Now the difference that you I don't know if you have noticed it or not, but you start to see that it is running in a container, probably an orchestration system behind it, like like Kubernetes. So if you see that previously we don't get it because like it is running in my local system as a simple single application. Uh, but if you see here now we are running on a Linux based OS as container SDS, look number of instances two and orchestration it's showing that it also shows the specific node name that is there. And uh, let me kind of show you the uh, stuff here. Maybe yeah, it's just picking up, but let me refresh it for every one second so that we will start seeing data regularly. So, so it will pick up uh, what is there and like uh, what are the what is the traces that are being shipped and uh, you will also be able to see the JVMs uh, profiling information like how much CPU uh, and uh, how much is the IO and everything that is happening. Uh, it's just loading. I think it, it will take a bit of time because I have multiple things running, so it should take a bit of time. So it also has a service map uh, like uh, how, how your microservice is connected to multiple pieces, like how the data is being flown and uh, how you are uh, like, you know, the entire thing is happening. So let me disable this. Maybe this is free call, keep on like, you know, running. Yeah, exactly. So I, how, how your uh, uh, service is running the mic to connected to multiple databases or stuff. Uh, if you have uh, uh, multiple microservices written in different languages, even you could find out how the data is flowing. What are the request response time? I could also go and click on focus and see some information details and uh, find out uh, from the point of errors. I don't create. I didn't create any errors. But then uh, you could find out that as well. See, you could find out CPU information, system memory usage, heap memory, garbage collection cycle, how it is happening, and is there any irregularities in that? Um, let us go and look at the trace as well. So you could go and look at the trace, get students, and then like find out how the throughput is happening. Uh, you see, initially it was less, but then like it picked up and it was delivering much faster, and um, and then like the time spent by each type. Initially, uh, initially it was probably like uh, I took a lot of time, maybe one transaction which took a lot of time. Maybe it's the application got cold started, but then later point of time you see more transactions in the 200 to 300 milliseconds. Probably I could still improve the application and make it somewhere around 100 millisecond. And uh, you'll also see uh, the what are the various uh, things that are there, uh, what are the headers that are there, and what are the uh, parameters that I have posted. And if you want to investigate, uh, if you have logs, if you have metrics, if you have specific details, you could go and click. If you want to see the service, uh, whether the service is working or not, you could go to the status and you could go and look at all of that. So we didn't collect that. We could enable that, but I guess that's too much uh, to do in like you know 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Maybe you will be bored. So so yeah. So that is that is it uh, from how this is being run. And if you have any questions, I am happy to kind of like you know take. At this uh, point, I'll also show you some more slides, but then like I'm not done. Uh, but then, yeah, if you have more questions, happy to answer. No questions? Am I audible? Yeah, I've been here. Okay, okay, great. So I'll go back to the the, the slide deck 
and then I'll show you uh, the links uh, to and to the repository. I'll also share you this presentation as well as uh, the details in the in the chat so that you could uh, you could kind of like download and run this thing. Uh, the samples can be uh, changed, uh, put it into a different format as well. Like just just these are simple samples that you could do. Uh, so I'm using Spring Boot, but you could also change the framework as well. Uh, we also do uh, meetups and uh, events like these. So if you want to join the community of uh, community dot elastic .co, we have a Slack channel. If you want to like you know kind of join the Slack and ask questions, uh, it's there. If you want to ask questions on discuss forum, discuss elastic .co is also there. It's very popular. Uh, more resources regarding the Java APM, how the training and uh, there's a, there's a free training course that you could attend and try it. So you could go ela.st slash Java APM. I'll post this link as well. That's it from my side and uh, thanks for the opportunity, uh, Rashmi and like Vivek and uh, any questions I'm happy to answer at this point. Great. Yes. Any, any questions? You can either type or you can also unmute and ask the questions. Yeah. I'm just going to paste the links here so that you are getting it. So, okay, if uh, there are no questions, I'm happy to paste it later. I mean, uh, maybe the next speaker is ready. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for joining and asking questions. Thank you. Thank you, Arvin, so much for an amazing session. Thank you, Rashmi. Yeah. Any, any questions or else uh, we can break, take a break for an hour and come back for a workshop. Yeah, thanks for the break. You're feeling hungry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. I Th think. Thank um, you, Arvind. Yeah, thank you all. So we will start our session again from 2, 2 p.m. So there would be an interesting session, like a mini workshop. So looking forward again to seeing you all. So for now, we'll just break for an hour and uh, we'll back be back at around 2 p.m. again. Yes, thank yeah. you, Sarvan. Thank, thank you for an amazing session. Yeah. Thank you all. Catch up again at 2. Bye-bye.